and as we prepare for a meaningful celebration of the birth of our Lord, let's stand together for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for the repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, friends. Grace, mercy, and peace to all of you from God who is our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ of God. Amen. I was working on this sermon, and I happened to come across a little article uh, about a guy that I'd read about um, a long time ago. His name was Jeremy Bentham, okay? Now, Jeremy Bentham died in 1823. He was a lawyer, English lawyer, uh, who became a philosopher, and he was the founder of what we, what's called utilitarianism. There's a a mouth for an early morning, all right? A mouthful. Utilitarianism. And what utilitarian, I'll get this out, utilitarianism is about, well, let me quote from Bentham. Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. Okay, the idea is that you need to maximize pleasure for as many people as possible and to minimize pain for as many people as possible, including yourself. Now, here's a a little aside, a digression. Bentham had a lot of money, and he left in his will that he'd give a sizable amount to his alma mater, to uh, University College of London, if if they were, after his death, were to embalm his body and put his brain in a jar and kind of fix him up and present him to the public. And they did. And he's still there. What's left of him, they bring him out in kind of a glass cage and he's got a hat on his head and a cane in his hand. There's Jeremy Bentham, died in 1823, and he's still bringing a lot of pleasure to undergraduates, all right? Because they bring him out for a party, you know, with Jeremy. There he is in his glass case. Now, according to Bentham, the whole purpose of our lives is, again, pleasure and avoid pain. And I was um, thinking about this when I was working on the sermon about John the Baptist, and I thought it's uh, maybe just a coincidence they've got the same initials, okay? JB versus JB. Uh, John the Baptist versus Jeremy Bentham. And I kind of got this idea, they're in a wrestling match, you know, in one corner there is Jeremy, and he says the purpose of life, you should avoid pain and maximize pleasure. That's what the good life is. Then you got John the Baptist, and he's saying something very different, repent, which means sometimes we need to do what is personally painful in order to please God. And I don't know, people will live these lives, and this has kind of been, Bentham has kind of been, oh, it's, it, he wouldn't actually say this, but if it feels good, do it, that kind of mentality, and if it doesn't feel good, then don't do it. That's kind of how he has been interpreted by the masses in some way. And one of the most painful things, though, that John calls us to do is to repent and to confess our sins. It's a lot easier to confess other people's sins 
It's a lot easier to read about other people's sins, those tabloids in the marketplace, right? People love to read about other people's sins, to delight and to judge other people's sins. But to confess my sins, I mean, to really lay it out there, well, that's painful, that hurts. But that's exactly what was happening under the preaching of John the Baptist. In our gospel lesson, then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. By the way, in June, we were at the Jordan River. We were not rebaptized. We don't do that, but we did reaffirm our baptism. We got in there, spl- remember that you were baptized, and kind of a thing like that. But they were going out and they were confessing their sins. They weren't confessing other people's sins. They were coming clean about their personal sins. So here's the sermon in a nutshell. We need to better understand what it means to repent and what it means to confess because that's really the way we prepare for the coming of Christ, both in his coming and sometime in the future, his coming again. And as he continues to come to us in word and sacrament, he really does come. How do we prepare ourselves to meet Jesus Christ, repentance and confession. Well, let's look at that first word, repent, okay? Uh, You've heard that before many times. The word in the Bible in Greek is metanoia, and that means, well, it means a change of mind. You have a change of mind, like, you know, what was I thinking? You ever have something like that? I got a friend who's a recovering uh, alcoholic and drug addict, and he's a very wise man, and he told me once when he'd lost everything, When he found himself in a gutter, he said, my best thinking got me here. Doing exactly what I wanted to do, this is where it led me. To repent is have a a change of mind. You know, there is a better way to live. And to think, you know, what, what was I thinking when I did that? It's also to have a change of heart. And that means that we're sorry. We have sorrow for our sin. But there's also a third aspect of repentance, and that is a change of behavior. And we, we miss this so often uh, because we think, well, to repent, I, I change my mind, bad idea, I feel sorry for my sin, but oftentimes we forget that true repentance means that we change what we do. We do not do what we were going to do that was wrong, and we do what we should be doing. It's a change of behavior. And as I was thinking about this sermon, I got this idea. I, you know, I, I read a little German. It's not good, but I, I've studied German quite a bit, and I, w- I said, I'm going to check out how Luther translated uh, repentance. And I thought it was going to be the German word to turn around, because sometimes they, he does use that word, but he didn't. And I actually called one of our German-speaking members of the church to make sure I got this right, because Luther translates the word repent with two words, tut buse, which means do penance. For Luther, if we repent, it's actually something that we do differently. We can have, a, you know, a change of mind. What was I thinking? And we can have a change of heart. I, I'm sorry. But that's not really repentance. That's regret. And there's a great deal of difference between regret and repentance. Repentance is when you have a change of mind, a change of heart, and a change of behavior. And this is brought out specifically in Luke's gospel in the same story of the ministry of John the Baptist. When these people come to him, the people of the land, the general public, he's, they say to him, what should we do? And he says, whoever has two coats, give to one who has none, and food likewise. The tax collectors are coming to him. They said, what should we do? And he says, collect no more than the amount prescribed. Soldiers come to John. They say, what should we do? Do not extort money by threats and false accusations. You see, to repent is to be followed by acts of penitence. They are penitential acts. There is such a thing as kind of a faux repentance. Let me tell you one example of um, rather egregious, all right, in my life and ministry. When I was a young pastor, you know, I like to hang on to that word, you know, a little bit. You know, when I was really a young pastor, all right, I got a call one day, and this guy, and you, this is a long time ago in a land far away, so you'll never know who this is or anything like that. I got a call, and this guy was it just it, emotional, crying, crocodile to, or tears. Pastor, I have to meet with you. Sure, let's meet. So we met together, and he shared with me, just grieving, cha- bad idea, his heart is hurting. He'd had an affair, and his wife found out. 
All right? So that's two strikes, big ones, right? And he said, can you meet with us? You know, maybe you can help us out. Would you? I said, oh, we'll meet together. And so we met, and we talked, and they wept, and there was anger, and we prayed together, and they reconciled. You see, he had a change of mind and a change of heart, but six months later, he did the same thing. <laughs> he didn't have a change of behavior. You know, I'm a very nice guy. I really, I, if I say so myself, all right? If I say so myself. Most people who know me say, Pastor Reason is a very nice guy. And I think I'm a nice guy. John the Baptist wasn't so nice, all right? Because John the Baptist would have looked at this guy and said, you spawn of a viper? <laughs> who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Bear fruit in keeping with your repentance. Because to repent, if we really know what that means, it's a change of mind. Where was my thinking here? It's a change of heart. It's feeling sorrow, and it is a change of behavior, and that's the ministry of John. But he also calls them to confess. To repent, you got those three things, but what does it mean to confess our sins? Uh, well, we have the general confession often, you know. We confess generally that we have sinned against everybody and against God, and we're sorry for our sin. That is a general confession, and that's a fine thing. But I think also to confess means that we confess specifically. Not every sin we've ever committed, because if I confessed every sin and thought, word, or deed I'd ever done, I mean, I would never get out of here. You know what I mean? It would just be a litany, one after the other. But it does mean there are times when our conscience is burdened by something that we need to confess specifically, and that's because it hurts. We do not like to confess our sins specifically. We like to hide our sins specifically. We are Adam and Eve. You remember Adam and Eve in the garden? After they had eaten the forbidden fruit, what did they do? They hid in the bushes. And after God flushed them out of the bushes, they started to blame each other. This woman you gave me, this serpent did this. They do the blame game, no responsibility, no specific responsibility. I was listening to a podcast when I was on the elliptical, all right? Make hay while the sun shines, right? And I'm listening to this podcast by this uh, theologian, and he says confession is like bird hunting. Bird, and I thought, where is this going, all right? Bird hunting. He said, you've got to flush the bird out before you can shoot it. There are sins that need to be flushed out because they will burden us. We'll always, always be hiding them. We confess in a general way, we are forgiven in a general way. When we confess in a specific way, and I mean before another human being to say, this is my sin, and we hear the word of forgiveness, that's when we begin to experience what forgiveness is. Yeah, I have a friend, and um, about 10 years ago, she, she'd been raised a, a devout uh, Protestant family, uh, had been baptized as an infant, confirmed, Communion, Lenten services, tithing, you know, all of those things that you, you do, uh, a prayerful, faithful, all of that. But when she went uh, to her first confession before a priest and she shared her heart, the priest said to her, you don't really believe that Jesus loves you, do you? You really think that Jesus is holding that against you, don't you? And then he spoke the word, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. And she told me for the first time in a long time, she really felt forgiven. She really experienced the love of God. You know, we live in a unique time this is the first time, I mean the last, let's say, 100 years, in the history of Christian discipleship where the average Christian did not have a confessor. Up until this time in history, Christians of all stripes had a person, a pastor, someone they could go to, but today we live in our quiet desperation and our solitude, holding on to our sins, saying, I know that God will forgive me, and yet never quite feeling forgiven. I know that's true. 
I've seen that. I've experienced that. You know, I've been preaching about John the Baptist for over 30 years, and only this year did it ever really occur to me that John the Baptist, this fiery brand of a preacher, dressed for unsuccess, what motivated him, what drove him, what inspired him was not anger. It was love. John wanted people to repent and confess their sins so that they would know that they are loved and forgiven by God. And that's the timeless message. Repent and confess. If you have a burden on your heart that you've been carrying, and I've experienced it in my, in my study, and when people said, I've been holding on to this for decades, decades, and never really being free. What is God calling us to do? as we prepare for Christmas? Is he calling us to forget? No, I think he's calling us to do something painful, to repent and confess, and then have the pleasure of knowing his forgiving love. Huh? That's, that's how we prepare for Christ, to repent and to confess. Yeah, it hurts. But is it better to live in hiding? I don't think so. God wants to give us the joy of knowing that we are loved and we are forgiven. May it be so among us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.